upset about that. Um, my name is Damien Kyo. I'm a lawyer and I specialise in construction and engineering uh, contracts and in particular in disputes arising under those contracts um, in all sorts of dispute resolution forms including conciliation, mediation, arbitration, court proceedings and in due course uh, adjudication. I'm a certified adjudicator with the uh, Chartered Institute of Arbitrators and also uh, an accredited mediator and uh, with the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators and uh, with CEDAR. As Tom mentioned, the Construction Ca uh, Contracts Act came into, uh, was enacted in 2013, sorry, this is obviously not working, <laughs> in uh, 2013 and has yet to actually become operative in Ireland. Um, however, it is expected to happen this year, but we've heard that before, so we'll wait and see. Um, when it does become operative, it will be compulsory uh, to have any dispute arising under a construction contract uh, in relation to payment to be uh, adjudicated. So there won't be the option to go to mediation or conciliation first. You'll have to adjudicate your dispute. So there's a real need uh, for everyone to become aware of adjudication and pra practically everybody in this room and in th this conference today needs to get up to speed on adjudication because what's when it does come in, uh, it will be uh, very um, it, you know, necessary to do so because it will be compulsory when disputes arise. So the England, they've had uh, adjudication in England now for almost 20 years. Um, they've had uh, hundreds of cases in relation to adjudication and a lot of those cases relate to uh, the commencement of adjudication and the, the issues that arise at the start of adjudication. Um, and it's that that I'm going to focus on today because we can learn an awful lot from the English experience. Um, our Act is not dissimilar uh, in relation to adjudication, it's not as comprehensive as the English Act, uh, uh, which is a uh, uh, fairly uh, hefty piece of legislation, but nonetheless uh, we can learn a lot from that experience. When we uh, embark eventually, when we do embark on adjudication in Ireland, uh, there's a huge amount of uh, English case law and precedent uh, which will really assist us in, um, in you know, guiding us through that procedure. So, um, under uh, Section 6.1 of the Act, a party to a construction contract uh, has the right uh, to refer for adjudication um, any dispute relating to payment arising under the construction contract. So in order to come within the scope of the Act, uh, there first has to be uh, a construction contract within the meaning ascribed to that uh, term under the uh, legislation. There must be a dispute um, arising under that contract and the dispute must relate to payment. So it all sounds very straightforward but unfortunately it's not. It's a little bit more complex as you, as you might expect. Um, the meaning of construction contract is uh, defined at the very start of the Act as the carrying on of uh, construction operations, so that would include your main contract, subcontracts and sub-subcontracts, etc. Uh, the, also the arranging for the carrying out of construction operations, so that includes the management type contract or the construction management contracts which are becoming more uh, common, and also uh, labour only type contracts. So the key term there is construction operations and that term is also defined under the Act and it's a pre it defined pretty broadly uh, in terms of construction, alteration, repair, maintenance, uh, extension, demolition, dismantling of works, forming or to form part of the land. And uh, so it's a very broad uh, uh, definition in the first instance. Um, but you might, it, it's interesting to learn from the English uh, case law in that regard because there are a number of cases where they've actually uh, determined that a construction, uh, an operation was not a construction operation. And one of the cases mentioned up there is Staveley, that involved uh, some oil rigs, offshore uh, structures, where they held that, the court held that the, uh, because the uh, structures were bedded on, this, on the seabed, they were formed on the seabed, that they were below the water level, they weren't part of the land. So, you know, there, those sort of cases uh, may well arise in our own jurisdiction. Um, it includes walls, uh, aircraft, runways, docks, industrial plants, uh, all your M&E type works, 
internal, external cleaning works are even considered construction operations and would be subject to the Act. Um, operations that are uh, integral part of construction um, or uh, rendering complete, so commissioning contracts for process plant will be, will be caught by the Act. Um, scaffolding operations, that case up there that I've mentioned, Palmer's uh, Limited and ABB, that was a case in the UK where the, it was scaffolding to an exempt operation. So the uh, scaffolding was in respect of a plant, uh, process plant. The process plant was exempt. The boiler element in particular was exempt. It didn't get caught by the Act, but the scaffolding itself was subject to the Act and subject to adjudication. Um, painting and decorating, uh, internal and external, and uh, making and installing sculptures, murals, uh, all sorts of stuff. That actually is excluded under the English legislation. And then all the consultancy agreement, all those ancillary services, architects, uh, all the designers, the archaeology work, quantity surveying, appointments, engineering, project management, all of those uh, agreements are all subject to the Act as well. So it's pretty much anybody involved in the construction industry is going to be subject to this Act and all those appointments are going to have to, the consultants' appointments, all the subcontracts, uh, supply and uh, installation contracts are all going to have to have uh, uh, or be referred to adjudication in the event that disputes uh, arise under the contract. Um, there are some operations which are excluded. Uh, the manufacture and delivery of uh, plant and machinery and uh, equipment like that, but only uh, if it's just a supply, if it's a supply and fit, supply and installation, they're caught by the legislation as well. And then there's some other uh, broader exclusions. Um, so contracts for not more than 10 grants so or small contracts are excluded. And also contracts relating to uh, dwellings with a floor area of not greater than 200 square metres and also where one of the parties occupies or intends to occupy a residence. So if you take the example of a landlord uh, with a residential letting, even though the they might be carrying out works to extend that uh, uh, residence uh, for uh, uh, less than 200 square metres, uh, that contract would still be caught by the Act on the basis that you would expect the landlord is not going to occupy uh, the premises or intend to occupy the premises. And there's a number of English cases I've mentioned there where uh, the uh, courts have held that uh, where works were being carried out, for example in the Samuel Thomas case, works were being carried out under a contract to renovate two properties. One was going to be occupied and the other wasn't going to be occupied and the court held that overall the contract was principally uh, couldn't uh, uh, be described as relating to a dwelling as uh, part of the building was going to be let uh, or sold. Um, and similar decisions were taken in uh, Shaw and Massey uh, in relation to a dwelling where it was a separate building to the main residence and it was decided it was uh, the overall contract was a, a contract for uh, which was caught by the Act. Um, and under the, uh, this piece of legislation that's been introduced, it will not be possible for parties to contract out of this. So even though two parties, uh, say a developer and a main contractor, decide that they're they don't want to have their disputes resolved through adjudication, they can't contract out of this Act they will have to have the dispute resolved by adjudication. Um, but if you're an excluded contract, based on the English case law, the Nordop case that I've mentioned there, you can actually contract into adjudication. So even though your contract might not come within the definition of a construction contract under the legislation, you can nonetheless choose to uh, be subject to adjudication in the event of a dispute. I've mentioned Lovell projects uh, because that case uh, decided uh, that um, the, the judge held that um, adjudicate, the adjudication clause it doesn't contravene uh, the um, Human Rights Act uh, in relation to the right to take legal action uh, and that's an important point as well. There are other excluded contracts, any employment contracts or PPP contracts are excluded as well under the legislation. So having um, uh, established that uh, the construction contract comes within um, the scope of the Act, the, the next question is really, has a dispute arisen? And it might seem a very straightforward question. Um, any of you who've been involved in uh, uh, disputes will know that it's, it's not as straightforward as, as it might appear. And there's been a lot of case law, both in Ireland and in England, and the English case law has been very helpful um, in relation to adjudication, 
as to whether or not there's a dispute uh, has arisen. And in the AMEC case, uh, the judge in that case, uh, Judge Jackson, he derived a number of principles, and it's worth it would be worth looking at those debates to, you know, uh, when a party seeks further information uh, in relation to a claim, um, if that's not responded to, uh, it does a dispute arise or not? And the answer is no. Uh, that was the uh, effectively the decision in the um, in the Carillion case, which is also mentioned up there. Uh, where uh, a request for further particulars of a claim that was put forward by a contractor was uh, uh, met with, uh, was not responded to, and the court held that no dispute had arisen um, in that situation. So uh, you need to be conscious of that. The legislation, it talks about uh, the Construction Contracts Act, refers to a dispute and not disputes in the plural. And there's been, again, a lot of English case law on this issue. Uh, the Sindel and Solon case is probably the best... Uh, authority on the matter uh, because it, it effectively says this look you know a, a dispute can have many component parts and different elements and sub disputes and all the rest of it and it's all really just one dispute but in a case that same year there was an opposing uh, decision uh, by the court that if because uh, adjudication is meant to be uh, a very um, uh, speedy and summary process that uh, it's not suitable to have a whole lot of different claims within the one dispute and the, uh, it, it's better to have separate adjudications for each of the elements of the claim, um, which, as you can imagine, would you know, create quite a, a, a cumbersome and complex situation if you've got a number of disputes involving you know, a claim for loss and expense from delay or then a claim for variations, a claim for defective works, whatever it is. Uh, you'd like to wrap them all up in one adjudication. Well, on the basis of the bar case, uh, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't be entitled to do that. But that was overturned, fortunately, in the Whitney case, uh, in which the judge said, look, it really all comes down to money. Um, and the question is, how much was, in this case, beam construction? How much were they owed on the final account? Um, and that's very relevant to, in an Irish context. The fast track case, actually, this, the, the judge uh, reached a similar um, decision. He said, look, you can characterise this dispute as how much money is owed from one party to another. Uh, and that's what's in dispute. There may be a whole load of constituent elements of the claim, um, but it's really how much money is owed. And in an Irish context, that's really relevant, those, that case law, because our legislation relates only to just payment disputes. So therefore, you would have thought that every dispute uh, in an Irish context could be wrapped up in one adjudication rather than a whole series of adjudications. Uh, in my view, Relating to payment is actually uh, a term which uh, we'll see what happens, but it's a term which I think is uh, probably uh, going to be interpreted as everything under a construction contract ultimately relates to payment. Otherwise, you wouldn't be disputing it, uh, I don't think. Um, another thing to be aware of is uh, the term arising under the construction contract, and it doesn't mean out of or in connection with the construction contract. It has to be under the contract. And again, uh, in an Irish context, the decision in the Carter and Edmund Nuttall case is uh, quite relevant insofar as the question in that case was whether or not uh, a particular term had been incorporated into the contract. Um, and the court held that uh, this was a matter arising under the contract and this is a matter which should uh, be uh, subject to adjudication. And of course, in an Irish context, if that particular term, which was in dispute, uh, had nothing to do with payment, then uh, whether it was incorporated or not would not be a matter which would be subject to uh, adjudication. Um, the other two cases are worth mentioning as well. The air design case uh, related to um, uh, an original contract with a number of supplementary agreements. Um, and the court held that any dispute under the supplementary agreements were arising under the original contract because the supplementary agreements effectively uh, represented variations to the original contract. Um, the Michael John construction case as well uh, is relevant from the perspective that that was a dispute involving uh, who was the correct employer, um, which you might think uh, is, you know, something which would be blatantly obvious. In my experience, it's, it's not. Uh, there's, I've been involved in a lot of disputes where uh, it's difficult to even identify who the employer was. You'd find the employer's name on the contract is different to the employer 
who's paying the, 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 the bills and might be different to the employer who invited tenders in the first place and they could be all different entities. So it's not a straightforward issue. Um, but the court in that case found that really the question was uh, who, as to who was the employer really came back to who was liable for payment. Um, and therefore, that was an important uh, uh, obligation under the contract and therefore the question as to who was the employer was an issue that could be adjudicated because it arose out of, uh, uh, under the contract, I should say. So, having established the right uh, to uh, refer the dispute to adjudication, uh, the Section 6.2 then goes on to provide as to how you would initiate that adjudication. Um, and that's done through serving uh, on the other party uh, at any time notice of intention to refer the payment dispute uh, to adjudication. And this notice of intention to refer is commonly known as the notice of adjudication. And everybody is going to, within this room and in this conference here today is going to get very familiar with uh, some of these terms when this uh, act comes into force. Um, and needs to know what their notice of adjudication needs to contain and when it needs to be served and etc. So uh, these are really uh, important issues. Um, the notice may be served at any time and uh, the English cases that are listed up here uh, found that uh, at any time means that if in the case of the Molum case there was a precondition that before the parties go to adjudication they had to uh, uh, serve a notice of dissatisfaction of the engineer's decision on the other party and the court held that, that was invalid that uh, they that you couldn't put a precondition like that the, the right to adjudicate to refer a dispute to adjudication arose at any time and you didn't have to first serve a notice of, uh, dis, of um, dissatisfaction um, so it, it, it's compulsory to go to adjudication before you do anything else, and you can do it at any time as you, uh, if you wish. And the, the Carter case uh, was on the, a similar point. In that case, it was a provision that the parties uh, could go to mediation before adjudication, and that was struck down. That was found to be invalid as well on the basis that uh, it, uh, you know, didn't, it, it prohibited the parties from going to adjudication at any time. Um, and in the Connex and Herschel cases, those decisions involved uh, the, the courts uh, ha ha holding that um, the uh, right to go to adjudication arose even after the contract had been repudiated or terminated or even after the expiry of the limitation liability period. You can still go to adjudication. You might have difficulties succeeding if the liability period is expired, but nonetheless you have that right. Um, so once you've uh, done that, uh, you've, you've served uh, your notice of adjudication successfully, then uh, the parties have five days to agree on who the adjudicator is, um, and that five days runs from the date of uh, the, no the notice being served, and if they can uh, uh, agree on an adjudicator, that adjudicator then has two days within to which to accept or reject. And I'm mentioning all these time limits because these time limits in the UK, in the Eng English legislation, have been enforced really strictly, uh, which is something that, you know, as Irish, we're, we're not great on time frames. This, if, if the courts in Ireland follow the English precedent in this regard, then time frames are going to be strictly enforced, and if you miss your time frame, your adjudication will come to an end, and you'll have to maybe start the whole process again if you can. Um, and uh, so then the appointment is made, um, and... Um, it's made on the uh, uh, date on which the adjudicator's acceptance is notified in writing to the parties. And if they fail to agree then uh, on who the adjudicator is or, or for some reason he rejects the appointment or whatever, then the chair of the panel will select uh, an adjudicator. And this is, I think, the issue which is holding up the legislation coming into force is that uh, the panel, the, uh, the adjudication panel is yet to be finalised by the government. And there's also a code of practice which is in draft form which has to be finalised as well. So hopefully they'll be dealt with soon. Um, so finally, uh, you've managed to get your adjudicator appointed. The next step is to actually uh, refer the dispute to the adjudicator and you do that by way of what's called a referral notice. Again, the timing of this is absolutely critical. It has to be seven days 
from the date on which the appointment of the adjudicator was made. And just by way of example of the um, uh, strictness in which these time frames were, have been enforced by the courts in England, um, I mentioned the Hart uh, Investments and Fiddler case, where that referral notice was issued on the eighth day. So the claiming party put together the referral notice, which is a bulky, generally a bulky document in construction disputes. It's generally a fairly, uh, you know, could run into many, many lever art files. But they put together that and they delivered it on the eighth day to the adjudicator. And the judge held that it was out of time. Um, and they had to start the whole adjudication process again. Uh, even though it was one day late, the judge concluded that um, the timetable for adjudication couldn't be extended because adjudication in, in adjudication speed took priority over accuracy and he kicked it out and the adjudicators ultimately who had gone on having received it a day late and made his decision and 28 days later or whatever uh, his decision was in null and void so you can imagine how that went down with the claiming party um, so uh, it's, a, it's a very important document um, it has to include all the contentions relied on uh, in support of the parties, uh, the claiming party's case, uh, and all and any redress that's sought. Um, so, in other words, it has to set out all the legal, contractual, factual uh, basis of the claim and dispute. So, it's like compressing a arbitration or co court proceedings into a really tight time frame. Uh, effectively, seven days from the day that you've served your notice of adjudication. And what that means is that way back before you even serve your notice of adjudication, before cl your claim is, is, uh, is actually put to the, to the opposing party, you really have to be well prepared. You have to be prepared way in advance um, because these time frames are strictly imposed and if you miss them, you're going to have to start again. Um, so you also have to include all copies of the, and extracts from the contract, any supporting documentation that you're relying on, and you have to, the, the copy of the notice of adjudication. You send all that to the adjudicator and you copy it to the responding party and then the adjudication uh, starts. I'm not going to go into that process because that will take us the rest of the afternoon to talk about. But I hope that I've illustrated, the point that I've illustrated is that um, it, it is, it's a piece of legislation which we have to take very seriously, which everybody in this room is potentially ultimately going to be involved because it, it cuts across nearly every type of construction contract and uh, contract within the construction industry. Um, but there's a lot that we can learn from what the UK have gone through. They've, they've had 20 years of this um, and we can look to a lot of UK legislation, um, uh, sorry, uh, case law, uh, it, which will hopefully guide us through the process when ultimately it um, comes you know, into force. Uh, so thank you very much for your time. I, I know there's no question and answers session after this, but I'm around for the rest of the day. If anybody has any questions, feel free to approach me. I'm more than happy to um, answer those questions. Thank you very much.